Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, trade tip for TAT. Tech stocks were among the worst performers after tweets by President Trump appeared to escalate the trade standoff between the U.S. and China. Plus, after several high-profile debuts, the hottest IPO in years is on tap this week. We're going to lift the curtain behind Uber's public offering. And putting the app back in Apple, the company planning on releasing a slew of new features at the Worldwide Developers Conference. But first to our top story, President Trump fresh off saying that a trade deal with China could be coming within weeks is once again tweeting threats of raising tariffs. On Sunday, the president took to his favorite social media platform to say he's ready to more than double tariffs on China by this Friday. And U.S. tech stocks reacted predictably. Shares of Apple falling on the news Monday at one point sliding nearly 4 percent in the session, and it wasn't just Apple chip stocks dropping as well. Micron, NVIDIA, AMD all ending the day in the red. To discuss, in L.A., we've got Bloomberg Tax resident Apple watcher Mark Gurman, and here in the studio, Ian King, who, of course, covers the chip sector for us. Now, Mark, Apple shares had been on a roll uh, after they reported earnings, iPhone sales uh, presumably stabilizing. Is this trade issue the only thing driving Apple down today? Yes, I think so. I don't think there's anything that Apple investors are more scared of than this tariff situation with China. Uh, as you know, of course, over 90, 95 percent of Apple products, which they get the majority of their revenue from, are built in China. So anything having to do with exporting out of China to the United States and other countries, anything to do with building products and then selling them in China, those are, you know, sensitive topics to tariffs and, of course, sensitive topics for investors because of that. And so I think we've had a few very quiet months on the on the tariff front. So these tweets from President Trump over the weekend really shook investors this morning. So I think that's what you're seeing uh, the stock fluctuation coming from. Now, Ian, Trump's top trade negotiator told him that China was potentially backtracking on uh, some of the things that they agreed on after a very optimistic, positive round of talks. That seems to have angered the president. Um, one of the tweets that he shared uh, in the last few days, the U.S. has been losing for many years, 600 to 800 billion dollars a year on trade. With China, we lose 500 billion dollars. Sorry, we're not going to be doing that anymore. And I've got this chart in my Bloomberg here, which shows the widening trade deficit between the U.S. and China. What does this mean for chips? Yeah, I mean, semiconductors, in a way, are arguably the U.S.'s kind of greatest weapon. Um, they're basically designed, made here, and China is the biggest market. China is absolutely dependent upon importing semiconductors predominantly from the U.S., so there's a tremendous temptation there to use that as leverage. Chip investors, like Mark said, have been sort of pretending that everything was okay for the last three months or so. The index is up sort of 30 percent or, or more this year. So everybody's kind of been assuming that, oh, you know, it'll all work out in the end, it will all be fine. When we see a day like today, when it appears that things are heating up, at least the rhetoric, then people are, you know, rightly concerned about what that's going to do for earnings. Um, now, Mark, uh, let's talk a little bit more. We're actually getting new headlines coming out of the White House. The U.S. saying it will raise tariffs after China reneges on promise. Uh, the talk saw a big change in direction, according to Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin. Obviously, we're getting more headlines as they're coming in at this very moment, but not good necessarily for Apple or many tech companies, which have been the hardest hit by this news. Right. This is this is significant news. We'll have to take a look at the details and exactly what devices and types of products are going to be impacted by the tariffs. We'll have to see how it's going to work directionally. We'll have to see when these come into effect. But as we know, you know, Apple was able to sort of work around tariffs for a period of time around the AirPods and the Apple Watch. The iPhone hasn't been impacted. So that's what we're going to immediately, you know, jump on and look at to see if products like the iPhone, which makes, you know, over 60 percent of revenues for Apple, could be impacted. And of course, you know, we'll update you as after we take a close look at the announcement so more details reading the fine print of the latest right now uh, the US planning to raise tariffs on Chinese goods on 
Friday as a result of Beijing backpedaling on, on some commitments made during the negotiations. However, a Chinese delegation will still be going to Washington as planned this week with talks to happen on Thursday and Friday. Of course, um, U.S. Trade Representatives saying they had been making substantial progress, but now this seems to be a big step backwards. And Ian, there are some other complicating factors here, security concerns that are adding a layer of tension to the relationship between the United States and China. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely one of the underpinnings. I mean, in a sense, the semiconductor industry is getting what it wished for, but in a way that it didn't hope would happen, which is for years they've been complaining, arguing that, you know, the Chinese competitors have been unfairly taking advantage, stealing things, borrowing things, not necessarily paying for some of the IP. Obviously, the Trump administration has been pretty tough on that with, through the DOJ. We've seen action against companies, particularly Huawei. And, you know, the net effect of that is, oh dear, what might that have in terms of our access to the market, you know, a market that's enormously important to them. A lot of companies already this year, particularly chip companies, talking about how their China business is down, how that's impacting the Chinese um, demand for their products. And there is a concern underlying that, that guess what, maybe the Chinese are going to be pressured or feel more impetus into sort of finding their own way, supplying themselves. Apple shares right now falling to post-market lows on this new shares down a little over 2% mark right now. Presumably it's going to be a rocky few days. if. We're expecting another round of talks on Thursday and Friday, and we don't know for sure what the result will be. Of, of course, the U.S. saying, though, that tariffs will be raised as of Friday. Yeah, and not to be too optimistic about these things, but we've seen the White House put out deadlines to this Friday one, the day after talks are supposed to be scheduled, with the hope of using that as a leverage point or a negotiating tactic to sort of put, you know, the other side up against the wall here. So I would not be completely shocked if, you know, we get another headline late Thursday or Friday saying, you know, after negotiations, we're no longer raising these tariffs. But, of course, we will have to see what happens on Thursday and Friday to know for sure. All right, uh, Mark Gurman, Ian King reporting for us. Thanks so much. We'll continue to watch the fallout on tech. Meantime, we do have um, some more details on those talks coming out of Washington. President Trump's top trade negotiator, as I mentioned, saying the U.S. plans to raise tariffs on Chinese goods on Friday, accusing Beijing of backpedaling on commitments it made during negotiations. I want to get to Bloomberg's Saleha Mosin. So, Saleha, what, what is the very latest that we know? Uh, there you are from Washington. Uh, what's the latest from this latest round of, of negotiations? So essentially what we've heard is that they are confirming the, the news that we broke here at Bloomberg in the D.C. office this morning, that China had all of a sudden done an about face on uh, some of the details of the commitment of the um, trade deal that uh, Mnuchin and Lighthizer thought were set in stone. Uh, all of a sudden the Chinese decide we want to renegotiate re uh, some of those terms, and that was something that uh, caught the trade the U.S. trade team by surprise. The president was not happy to hear that uh, thing that he thought were kind of set in stone. They were ready to move on to the next level of the um, trade negotiations. And all of a sudden, China decided to change their mind on a few things. So he got a little bit upset and uh, sent off those tweets, which were not a huge surprise to people inside the administration, as oftentimes the president's tweets can be. Uh, Mnuchin did say during a briefing to reporters that uh, he is they are not uh, looking to the markets to validate or invalidate anything that they are thinking to do. They just want a good deal. And uh, the U.S. economy is strong enough to handle uh, anything that comes at them, whether it's uh, you know any kind of uh, knock-on effects from the, the tariffs. But uh, so far, we see that Chinese Vice Premier Liu He is still expected to come to D.C. this week. So, look, it's probably going to be a long few days, especially for U.S. stocks. Um, what can we expect next? How, you know, how does this progress? Yeah, well, what we heard from Mnuchin was that 90 percent of the deal was complete, and then they heard that the Chinese were backpedaling on some of their promises. Uh, we don't know exactly what's next. The meetings, if, you know, as long as uh, Chinese, uh, China, China's uh, Liu He still wants to come to D.C., he should be leaving uh, sometime in the next few hours to, to make it to D.C. in time. On Wednesday, Thursday, we, we expect some meetings uh, and possibly an announcement of a, uh, of a meeting between the two presidents, President Trump and President Xi from China. China. But uh, so far, Mnuchin said, Lighthizer said, and Trump has said that on Friday at 12.01 a.m., those tariffs will come into effect. And so stock markets uh, will probably be watching to see if there will be any um, backtracking on that threat or if uh, Trump has decided he is going to follow through on that. So far, they're they are holding steady on that. Right. What is the likelihood that, you know, that this now decision gets reversed? 
Oh, <laughs> in Washington, you just never know where we're going to be heading. Um, with one tweet, Trump could decide, uh, you know what, I've got a fabulous deal with China and I've decided uh, not to go through with the tariffs. But uh, I do think one thing is very true, that this threat is not an empty one. The president is not afraid to, to follow through on his word this time. All right, Zaleha Mosin, uh, Bloomberg News for us from Washington. We'll continue to follow any more headlines as they cross. Coming up, it is a big week for Uber as it continues its roadshow and heads to the public market. But will the debut live up to the hype? We'll discuss next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You are listening on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Shares of Lyft fell at the start of a crucial week for the ride-hailing company. Drivers are threatening a massive strike in the next few days. Analysts say that will highlight the regulatory concerns with Lyft's business model. Meantime, the company reports quarterly results on Tuesday. Now, rival Uber is no doubt the most anticipated tech IPO to happen in years. And while Goldman Sachs missed out on leading the company to the public markets, it didn't miss out on a different type of win. Only a year after Uber had started offering rides, Goldman's bankers bet a $5 million wager using the firm's own money that could have a potential $6 million windfall. Now it is up to Morgan Stanley to pitch the stock well and win a top-of-the-range stock price for Uber. If that happens, Goldman stands to reap a staggering 12,000% return. Just like week, Uber started its roadshow in London, traveled to New York and Boston before getting to San Francisco. The ride-sharing company is expected to price on Thursday afternoon and start trading on Friday. Here to discuss, we've got Pete Flint, co-founder of the early-stage venture capital firm NFX and investor in Uber's rival Lyft. Pete, of course, is also the founder and former CEO of Trulia. Thanks for being here. Great to so be back. What's it like being on the other side, analyzing other companies rather than running and worrying about your own? <laughs> uh, it is. Um, it's a different job, but it's fun. It's um, so now. So NFX is an early stage venture firm. We invest in in seed stage. So very different scale from the kind of public company that was that was Trulia. But it's just such a fertile ecosystem right now, and and we're seeing. You know, that you kind of think this year is so many IPOs are happening with a basis of network effects. Um, whether it's Uber, whether it's Airbnb maybe next year, whether it's Lyft, whether it's uh, uh, Zoom with, with network effects. So our thesis around network effect companies. And so building, uh, building and investing and, and finding these great entrepreneurs building network effect companies. So truly emerged with Zillow ultimately to staunch competitors, not unlike Uber and Lyft. Do you think that they can continue to operate independently? So for sure. I think there's... Certainly, there's a, there's a massive demand for this service. And I think, frankly, from a regulatory perspective, in the near term, it will be impossible for them to merge. At Truly and Zillow, we, we kind of like, it was a pretty close situation from a regulatory perspective, but it will be impossible now for okay. Uber and Lyft to merge from an from a antitrust perspective. So as an investor in Lyft, what's your view on Lyft versus Uber? So my, my partner, James Courier, is actually an early angel investor before NFX. So I personally don't have any investment in, in Lyft or, or in Uber, um, but he made an early investment. I spent some time with, with the Lyft team and, and spent a little bit of time with the, with the Uber team. I think when you look at the kind of fundamentals, um, Uber as a larger business is in a more interesting strategic position. Mm. Greater scale, greater network effects, greater selection in terms of options for its drivers as well as consumers and this global reach, which gives us an insight to consumers. Interestingly, especially coming from the founder point of view, Uber doesn't have as much founder control in part of some of the issues it had with its actual founder. Yep, yep. Uh, and, and the CEO doesn't have that kind of control, the current CEO, Dara Khosrow Shahi. However, Lyft does. does that, is that an intriguing proposition from an investor perspective? So I think it's, um, you know, there's a perception amongst some investors that found control is a net negative. Mm. But the reality is that this is a long, long, long journey. You look at the future of this industry, it's going to be driven by autonomous. It's not going to be driven by market share this quarter, next quarter. It's going to be driven by autonomous. So the company that gets autonomous right is ultimately going to be an interesting position. And that requires big, big bets. And, the, and the, I think the fear is that, or, or why investors are quite comfortable with, we lift having found a control is that they recognize that that is the long-term position for the company. Um, so I think, you know, it, it truly, we actually didn't have um, 
uh, the, the founder control of the company, whereas I saw when I joined Zillow's board um, as post-merger, they did have founder control. And actually that kind of that long-term thinking, um, that kind of like pure focus on the consumer was a net benefit to, to a company like Ziff's, Zillow. So it should help, help lift, I think, in, in the kind of near term, but the, you know, they're, they're up against some formidable management. When you look at, you know, obviously SoftBank backing combined with Dara and, and Barney as the top two folks, mm. these, are, these are very experienced executive focused on scale operations, which is somewhat different from the team at Lyft, which are kind of, they're awesome guys, but um, this is a very different rodeo from what they've done before. Okay, but can they make money, either company? I mean, Lyft is losing half as much money as it, it makes. Uber is losing billions and billions of dollars. We're just talking about this potential driver strike this week. That's an issue that yeah. faces both companies. You talk to any driver, anecdotally, and they complain yeah, that they're yeah. not making money. You know, they're still doing it, yeah, yeah. but they complain. So my, Lyft, my Uber this morning was um, exactly that. He was like complaining the price has gone, you know, his take home has gone down and down and down and down. And yet you look at the financials and they're losing billions. So supply meets demand at the right price. Yeah. And I think there is a, there's so much demand out there. Supply will, will, will kind of will match that demand at, at a certain price. And I think the, when you look at the, the scale and growth of, of Lyft, and, and Uber. So Uber is $11 billion in revenue. Um, yes, they're losing, you know, billions, but the operating leverage at scale they have will be significant. You know, you've, you've seen internally that, you know, I, I, when running, running truly, you look at the, the, as you scale, as you're growing so quickly, they are, you know, there's a new management team, there's huge amounts of inefficiencies in there. They will work out those inefficiencies over time and reduce that down. And then long term with autonomous, I'm confident that they can become profitable businesses. Okay, so if you were planning to take your pu company public on Friday and President Trump was planning to raise tariffs on Chinese goods on Friday, how much would you be freaking out about your public debut in so, the midst of all of this yeah. volatility? So I, you know, I remember vividly the pricing discussion um, where you've got bankers on one side, you've got your board and investors on the other side, you've got management team on the other side. And obviously Lyft, you know, arguably kind of messed up um, that situation. Okay, there's two ways to look at that though, because Lyft got yep. a lot of money for itself. Sure. The price is going down now, which certainly affects sentiment, yep. but now they have all that cash. Yep, I think they, you know, arguably they've priced it to perfection, but mm. there's certainly a negative sentiment around that. You've mm. seen the bank has reduced the, the pricing on, you know, the, the most recent IPOs Absolutely. With, with Zoom. And so, and they were, and certainly with Uber, they've, they've done a similar um, lower pricing. So I think there will be a kind of heated discussion. They're not trying to optimize for kind of um, they're not going to try and optimize for maximum cash. They'll, they'll optimize for momentum. This is a company that's trying to rebuild itself, and they're going to, they're going to try and create an, an exciting momentum story out of this. So at NFX, what are some other opportunities that you're looking at? So the core thesis around network effects, so that's across a range of different categories and strategies. So whether that's real estate companies, whether that's financial services, technology, even computational biology, we can see building platform businesses out of that. So a whole range of companies that we think in the next, you know, eight to ten years, we hope a bunch of them become public as well. All right. Pete Flint of NFX, formerly of Trulia. Good to have your perspective here. Thanks so much for stopping by. Thank you. Coming up, how Apple keeps walking that fine line between wooing outside developers and competing with them. What to expect from the annual Worldwide Developers Conference next month. We will have a preview. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg has learned Apple is planning a plethora of new apps and features for existing products like the Apple Watch at, a, at its annual developers conference next month. So what can we expect from this year's WWDC? Bloomberg's Mark Gurman back with us from L.A. And Mark, you have some new reporting about what exactly Apple plans to unveil. Tell us about it. So for this year, Apple's going to be focusing on a few things. One is the health capabilities of its devices, so additional health tracking uh, ahead of the new Apple Watch that will come out in the fall. Software to make the Apple Watch more independent, uh, improve performance for the iPhone and iPad, as well as new apps like Calculator and Audiobooks app for the watch, uh, improved health tracking and messaging and mail and maps on the phone. So it's basically a lot of little things across the board that add up to you know a big year over year update in iOS 13, Watch OS 6, and of course on the Mac, Mac OS 10.15. Now, there have been increasing concerns about Apple's power 
in running the App Store and then also having apps of its own. Spotify has complained about them in Europe. Um, Elizabeth Warren, Senator Elizabeth Warren, has proposed that Apple and the App Store break up. Do you think that will play into what we see at WWDC at all? No, it's not something they're going to mention. This isn't anything particularly new. This is how it's been from the very beginning of the App Store and iOS and you know, even Apple having its own Mac apps from the early days before the year 2000, right? It's just being increasingly talked about now because of comments from Senator Warren, uh, the whole Spotify situation. You saw the screen time. Uh, thing in the New York Times recently, which you know Apple says was just a, a security preventative issue because some of those parental guidance apps were using technology that could be intrusive. So no, I don't think this is something that get, gets highlighted uh, during the week, but it, it is an interesting perspective. So we've already seen uh, a services announcement earlier this year where they unveiled uh, the TV streaming service, uh, the new subscription service, gaming, a new credit card. Um, what else could we see besides these apps? Will there be a one more thing? Will there be something unexpected? Will there be something unexpected? I don't think so. Uh, what we do know is there's going to be the Mac Pro and potentially this new display to go along with it. Again, this is a very developer-focused event. There are consumer bashes at the end of the year, uh, September for iPhones, October for Macs and iPads, typically. So some of the more exciting stuff will come then, but these new software platforms are really going to set the stage for those other devices in the fall. And I think people on the, you know, on the Pro user side could be excited by a lot of these announcements. The Mac is certainly getting a big upgrade that's going to be a really big focus this year uh, for the app ecosystem. The iPhone changes at this point just don't seem that breakthrough. But in totality, they are a lot. And don't forget, they do this on an annual basis. So it's really hard to judge the scope of upgrades each June. Really, you need to judge them over the course, I think, of a two, three year period. All right, well, if there is anything unexpected, I know you're doing your best to try to figure out what that is. Bloomberg's Mark <laughs> Berman, as always, for us from LA. Coming up, tweeting against Twitter. The president unleashes his fury against social media once again, saying they're silencing conservative voices. We'll discuss. And later, vice media's challenges. We're going to hear from Nancy Dubuque, the CEO. This is Bloomberg. Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Well, we started the hour with President Trump and Twitter, and that's what we are starting the half hour with. Only this time, the president's ire was directed at Facebook and Twitter, claiming once again in a series of tweets that they are silencing conservative voices. I am continuing to monitor the censorship of American citizens on social media platforms. This is the United States of America, and we have what's known as freedom of speech. We are monitoring and watching closely. The latest tweet storm comes after a decision by Facebook to ban far-right provocateurs and conspiracy theorists, including Alex Jones, Milo Yiannopoulos, Laura Loomer, for violating its policies on hate speech and promoting violence. To discuss in New York, we've got Bloomberg Opinions Executive Editor Tim O'Brien and here in the studio, Bloomberg Tech Social Media Reporter Kurt Wagner. Of course, Kurt, we talked about this when it happened last week, yes. but now the president taking some new interest. And it's certainly interesting given that he's recently met with Jack Dorsey, right. the CEO of Twitter. Yeah, it is. And one of the things that he tweeted that stood out to me was he said, hey, we're in the United States. We have this thing called freedom of speech. Uh, the thing about these companies is they are global companies. They are not U.S. companies. Certainly they're U.S. based, but they are building rules and guidelines for people all around the world. And so oftentimes you will see that they kind of have these blanket policies because they are supposed to apply not just to people in the U.S., but to people everywhere. And so I think people sometimes forget that. They're also private companies, so they, they get to make the rules, they right? Are. I mean, this is a community, right? If you're Facebook, you try to weigh 
uh, what is more valuable to you. Is it, is it worth having total freedom of speech at the risk of maybe people feeling offended and alienated and then they don't want to use the platform because of that? Uh, Facebook has said, and Twitter and others, that there are rules that people have to abide by. Right. And of course, there's you know many folks who think that Facebook didn't do this soon enough. Right. Uh, still, another tweet from the president as part of this particular tweet storm, the wonderful diamond and silk, uh, two conservative commentators have been treated so horribly by Facebook. They work so hard. What's been done to them is very sad. We're looking into it is getting worse for conservatives on social media tim of course diamond and silk are uh two commentators who are uh, supportive of of president trump you know you of course wrote a biography of of the president before he became president and i know you have uh some particular insights into how he thinks you know what do you what do you believe is going on in the president's mind at this moment, to the well, extent that anyone can know that? Well, I mean, I think there's a couple things going on here. To, to the extent that the president's arguing for a principle that the, that the social media platform should be agnostic and shouldn't target anyone's speech, uh, and if they do, it amounts to censoring, is a worthy thing to discuss. But what we have to remember is, over this past weekend, he also tweeted that he didn't think the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN or MSNBC should be allowed to publish on Twitter. Uh, so he's really not arguing from a position of free speech or freedom of the press. Uh, he's, he's defending his advocates and targeting his enemies. Um, so I think that has to be unbundled when we're speaking specifically about the president. I think when we're talking about the social media platforms, I think they're entering into adulthood here. Uh, they want to be cons considered as technology platforms and not publishing enterprises, but the reality is they are putting published material uh, into the public realm. And, and that's always been subject to regulation, whether it was radio or TV or newspapers. And I think at some point, social media companies are gonna have to come to terms with the reality of that. And, and, and it, it comes with a different set of regulations and a different set of responsibilities. So, so t these two things are sort of colliding with one another. I want to go back to Facebook's statement last week when they banned these folks. They said, we've always banned individuals or organizations that promote or engage in violence and hate. The process for evaluating potential violators is extensive, and it is what led to our decision to remove these accounts today. Now, the word always is key because if you go back to even just five years ago, weren't these policies incredibly crude? I mean, I heard something like if it wasn't naked and it wasn't Hitler, it was just fine. Right, and there were breastfeeding photos <laughs> taken down, but there were historical photos of bombings and things that were left up. There was, the, there were a lot of people who picked up on that word always and kind of pointed out that uh, this isn't exactly how it has worked and it has always been complicated. It has <laughs> not always been very clear. And so, uh, you know, we've seen Facebook say time and time again, we don't want to be the arbiters of truth. We don't want to be the ones to actually decide what should stay up and come down. So they're actually, uh, in November, they said they were going to create this oversight committee where if you have content taken down, you can actually appeal to an independent board that would then review your case. We haven't actually seen that come into practice yet, but they have announced plans for it. And it's interesting, this is again them trying to say, we don't want to have to make these decisions. Now, I sat down with Senator Marsha Blackburn earlier uh, last week and asked her about this very issue. She's also been supportive of the president. She's also um, been uh, critical of the crackdown on conservative voices in particular. And here's what she had to say about this issue. Take a listen. What we have to realize is in, uh, the, in Silicon Valley, a lot of people have a more liberal bent. That is their preference. They bring that to work. They are engineering and building these algorithms. And then they probably tilt left instead of being down the middle. And we know they don't tilt right. Now, she's, she's making an important point, Tim, that the people who are building the algorithms, inevitably, they impact those algorithms. But, you know, clearly this is an issue that is um, getting increasing interest on both sides of the aisle. Do you think that this is something that's going to become a big deal in this election? Uh, I don't know if it'll be a big deal in the election. I think it's also always a healthy thing for us to discuss. I think we have to be really careful about the terms we're using. I don't know necessarily that this is a conservative versus liberal speech issue. Um, the, the Constitution has always regulated the type of free speech we're entitled to. We are all 
entitled to have free political speech. We're not entitled to stand up in a movie theater and scream fire. And I think one of the di distinctions Facebook was trying to make is it felt that some of the people that it decided to censor were trafficking in violent rhetoric. Uh, that's not classically conservative rhetoric. That's not classically liberal rhetoric. What they're trying to do is police violence or aggression on their platforms, which was in their rights. I think it's something senators from both parties could get behind. So I think this idea that, uh, you know, Louis Farrakhan or uh, Milo Yiannopoulos are representatives of conservative um, uh, speech is, is a little bit cute by half when if they're also trafficking in violent rhetoric. And I think that that's a really important distinction to make. All right. Well, this is certainly not the last time we're going to be talking about this. Tim O'Brien, Kurt Wagner for Bloomberg. Thank you both. Thanks, Emily. Coming up, despite calls for change, the gender gap in Silicon Valley is still wide open. We will highlight some of the women trying to close it. We'll discuss next. This is Bloomberg. A SpaceX Dragon capsule has docked with the International Space Station. The capsule arrived Monday morning carrying 5,500 pounds of equipment and experiments. The unmanned craft will stay there for about a month and will return to Earth carrying science samples. Well, the world of Silicon Valley has created endless success stories, but from venture capitalists to startups and big tech firms, they've mainly been focused on men. As the industry slowly starts to come to terms with its own gender gap, one author is highlighting the women who have made an impact. Julian Guthrie, author of Alpha Girls, the women upstarts who took on Silicon Valley's male culture and made the deals of a lifetime, and Teresa Goh, co-founder of Aspect Ventures, who's one of those women, um, are with me now here in the studio. Thank you both for joining us. It's great to be here. So, Julian, You've written many books, and I know you're, you're familiar with the tech industry and the Bay Area. You've lived here for a very long time. So I assume you had some sort of assumptions when you walked into this. But I'm wondering if, as you were on your reporting journey, you found out things that just surprised you. Actually, the whole thing surprised huh. me. So I had come out of my last book, How to Make a Spaceship. You referenced Elon Musk. Yeah. And that was very male-dominated, the last two books. And so this was surprising to me because you hear so much negativity about and it exists it's real in silicon valley but i found these really astounding women who had succeeded and i wanted to know how they did it and what the world there looks like for them going after deals sitting at the table meeting with entrepreneurs going out for funding and it surprised me how strategic they were in their success and how it is possible to kind of increment your way to success as they did navigating before they could pioneer. Um, so I was really wowed by that, by these stories. They're, the stories of Alpha Girls are very personal. So it's personal lives, it's professional lives, it's how women juggle all that they, we, do you're nodding your head mm -hmm. so the whole thing surprised me how women succeed uh, what the terrain is like what the outcomes are and that there are these really important success stories uh, notably Teresa right mm -hmm. here and how they did it and just their backstories yeah. I found so inspiring and I'm so glad you did and then Teresa I mean I learned things that I you know didn't know about you and I feel like I've interviewed you and talked to you about this many yeah, times for a long time but you Obviously, you worked at a male-dominated venture capital firm, Excel. You went on to start your own new venture capital firm. And I'm curious, um, what sort of strategizing you did along the way? The times where you knew you were the only woman going into a room and did something intentionally because of that? You know, I think that there's, uh, I would say the biggest thing is, being aware of that, and I think actually Magdalena says it really well in the book, to tip my hat to one of the other alpha girls, is sometimes you need to think about that as a strategic advantage. So like early in my career, I would realize if I was going to some big tech conference that it was actually potentially a positive. So if I'm, you know, if everybody's inundating these same entrepreneurs, if I can actually say something smart about their business, the chance that they're going to remember me instead of somebody else named Joe or Bob or Jim is higher. So viewing it as a positive instead of always viewing it as a negative, viewing it as an opportunity. So, Julian, obviously there are many, many w women who could have probably succeeded in Silicon Valley if the playing field was more level, and we hope there are many more Teresas to come. 
But what do you think it was about the women that you highlighted that enabled them to succeed in an area that was so male dominated? That's a great question. I think it was what Teresa touched on was looking past possible slights and possible barriers or very real ones and kind of looking beyond that and maneuvering beyond those things. So having a sense of humor was always super helpful. Mm. Being really optimistic, uh, finding an area of specialty like Teresa did in cybersecurity, being very quantitative. Uh, really knowing your stuff, working harder than just about any any guy in the room. Uh, so those were some of the commonalities that they had. And they love the industry too. You know, they love tech, they love venture capital, they love being a part of this that dynamic ecosystem that is Silicon Valley. So uh, in those ways, you know, they had they had optimism and they had perseverance, of course. Now, Teresa, you're now part of this sort of new movement. You and your partner, Jennifer Fonta, have gone off to, to start a new venture capital firm. Melinda Gates has invested in your firm. There are organizations like All Raise, which are women from competing venture fa capital firms who have gotten together to try to improve the representation of women in investing, um, women in entrepreneurship. Do you feel the change happening? Or yeah. do you still feel like we're stuck in the past? No. So. First, I would start with, I've always felt like there's always been sort of, it's been more secret underground sisterhood here in tech, right? I mean, kind of going back to some of the, honestly, tipping a hat to our, like the early pioneering days of the events that Cheryl would host at her house, where in the Cheryl beginning, Sandberg. Cheryl Sandberg, sorry, and in the beginning, me and I know many other people, we would just not put exactly what we're doing on just like dinner, right? <laughs> but then it kind of was like, and it was super helpful for us. But now it's like not only like out in the open, it's like, you know, the, the, the male entrepreneurs see it also as an advantage, right? The fact that we have this different network for recruiting, for deal sourcing. And so I think it can be, it's wonderful to see it be so public and out there. And the last thing I would say, those are all great groups. We wouldn't be anywhere without our male allies and Julian writes about them in the book. Mm -hmm. But I also think that Julian's book, it is, it's about it's about a lot of venture capitalists, four venture capitalists who happen to be female. But it's really, to me, she wrote a book that's really a story about four people who are from outside Silicon mm -hmm. Valley who came in, had no proven path, and just found their own way. Uh, and hopefully that will appeal to a broad range of entrepreneurs and people whose dreams potentially lie here in Silicon Valley. Now, in the middle of my own reporting process when I was writing my book, which is also about women in tech, the momentum changed. And people started talking about this. The Me Too movement happened. and I was in the middle of writing and everything exploded and I had to, you know, do a bunch more interviews and c call a lot of people. How did that change your reporting process? I'm curious, the fact that this conversation sort of, maybe it was underground before, but it sort of exploded out into the open. So I had thought that it would make the women less reticent, mm -hmm. more willing to speak out, maybe about injustices and wrongs. But with this book, I found that was the most challenging thing because these women have succeeded by, to a certain extent, being unflappable mm -hmm. and expecting perfectionism, certainly among themselves. Um, but to show their vulnerabilities was very difficult. Um, I think it's hard, you know, they, they, they worked so hard to get where they did and it was not easy and I write about those things in the book. Mm -hmm. So it was still something where um, they had to exceed expectations. It was hard, it was hard for them to be vulnerable, even post Me Too. Yeah. So that's, that was another surprise for me. Um, so Teresa, you've been investing now for a very long time. I'm so curious for an update on, on aspects, what you think is hot. You know, I want to hear. I want to hear your investing thesis. I want to hear from you where you think the puck is going. Sure. So, well, I don't know if this is where it's going. It's been for a while, <laughs> as you know, as Julian mentioned. I've been doing cybersecurity investing mm -hmm. since ninety nine, two thousand. So when it was this like, like small little backwater, and been fortunate to have a couple of those companies, like Forescout and others, which is from mm -hmm. our Aspect Fund, mm -hmm. go public. So that continues to be a big area of investment and interest. There's also quite a lot of activity. I'm sure everyone talks about it in terms of you know AI and machine learning, but in some very specific places that I think are really interesting. We do quite a few things in the fintech space that use that. So companies like Chime and Deserve are also in our portfolio in addition to Forescout and um, Exabeam, which are using machine learning and cybersecurity. And we're starting to see some really interesting applications of machine learning, potentially in digital health. So uh, more to stay tuned. but. FinTech and cybersecurity, the really boring stuff where a lot of the money is 
continues to be a hot area. So for what's your outlook on the recent IPOs and mm. upcoming IPOs? Uber this week, having just seen Lyft, Pinterest, Zoom. Uh, look, I think all of those companies are um, doing quite well, and I think we have more Slack and others, right, in the mm -hmm. pipeline. I think this is going to continue to be a really good time for growth tech IPOs uh, throughout the rest of this year. And is it impacting your investing strategy at all? It doesn't impact us because we invest at the mm -hmm. really early stage, at the Series A stage. So these are companies that are, you know, 5, 10, 15 years after that investment um, time frame. But what it does say is for those of our companies that are further along, uh, it does show them that, you know, the market is open now. We, we, just like with Trulia, we had Pete earlier on, that was Series A, but yeah. you know, five years later they're you know, in a later stage. So it's really impacting those companies from four or five years ago, not so much the new, new investment. All right, and as you mentioned, Teresa invested in Trulia earlier in her career, so good to have you and Pete reunite off the set. Um, Julian Guthrie, author of Alpha Girls, which is just out, and Teresa Go, Aspect Ventures, also always good to have you back here Thank you. on Thank the show. You. Great Emily. to be here. Thank you. Still ahead, Starbucks makes its premiere in Game of Thrones. Why the Twitter sphere is blowing up. Next, there you see it. It's a coffee cup. I told you. One of the world's largest asset managers will begin buying and selling Bitcoin. Bloomberg has learned that within a few weeks, Fidelity Investments will offer trading in the cryptocurrency, but it will be limited to institutional customers. While it is a show that's dark and full of coffee, HBO's Game of Thrones may only have two episodes left in its historic run, only two. But on this Sunday's episode, the fantasy world where people drink wine, mead, and, well, more mead found a new beverage for its otherworldly cast to imbibe. Coffee? Well, it seems that the crew forgot to remove what looks like a modern-day disposable coffee cup in front of Amelia Clark's character, Daenerys Targaryen. No doubt this joins historic movie gaffes like those in North by Northwest and others, only this time. I pity the barista that misspells the name of the mother of dragons. It's a hard one to discuss. In LA, we've got our entertainment reporter, Anusha Sakui. Okay, so I watched the first half of last night's episode and I totally missed it, Anusha. So either someone, a lot of people, totally missed it or this was intentional promotional advertising. Which one is it? <laughs> Well, that's uh, that's that's a conspiracy theory because uh, you know Game of Thrones has so many you know different partnerships that it had you know makeup brands, Scotch whiskey, handbags that maybe it was some kind of Starbucks partnership. HBO is only saying in some you know kind of jokey response that really it was it was a mistake. It was meant to be an, a herbal tea, um, and Starbucks's response has been like we're surprised it wasn't a, a dragon coffee or tea or something. One of their kind of you know, secret off-menu drinks. Apparently, this is a kind of Starbucks drink you can order. It's a dragon, a dragon drink. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it just happens on a lot of shows. You'd be surprised. There have been some other scenes where, like, you can see Daenerys's hair is different within the same scene. I have, you know, that's been caught in some. So, um, as you said, it, it's, it does happen, surprisingly. We have that tweet from, from Starbucks, TBH, we're surprised she didn't order a dragon drink. And I can say it's good advertising for Starbucks because I didn't know Starbucks had a dragon drink, but uh, whatever. Uh, another Game of Thrones gaffe over the weekend, Amazon Prime leaked the, the episode before it actually aired. What happened? Well, we've seen this um, a bit. There's been some uh, accidental leaking of, of the shows and um, it's you know unclear what, you know, how this happens. I mean, these shows cost a lot of money. Um, you know, about estimated about $15 million, which, you know, makes you wonder how something like this happens, especially if, like, you go over that Starbucks clip. It, it's, it's not easily missed. It, it's there for quite a little while. Um, so uh, it's... And, 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 you know, something like a leak is, is hugely problematic um, for uh, a show like this. So um, they haven't said anything about it yet, so we're, we're yet to find out how that happened. So are there a couple entertainment folks who are in big trouble today or what? 
they seem to be making light of it and the show's pretty much over but um I mean, and as you said, this happens. There's a lot of pressure on these shows. Uh, and, you know, it even goes back to like Ben Hur, the, the film. There was like, there's, there's an outtake where someone, uh, you know, one of the, uh, you know, soldiers is wearing a Rolex. Uh, you know, or if you go back to a Star Wars, the first Star Wars film, you know, you see one of the, one of the stormtroopers banging his head and I, that doesn't get caught. You know, it, it happens a lot. And, you know, you just don't under, you don't appreciate, I think as a viewer sometimes, how much pressure these productions are under. And I think when you're watching Game of Thrones, you know, these are some real huge set pieces they're putting together. And, you know, some of it slips through the cracks. I, I don't think they're firing anyone, but, uh, you know, who knows? <laughs> All right, well, no spoilers here, I'm sure. You already know about the coffee cup by now. Uh, Bloomberg's Anusha Sakui, as always, thank you for stopping by. Pleasure. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. On Tuesday's show, we're going to sit down with Melinda Gates to talk about her new book, The Moment of Lift. And we're live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Technology. And be sure to follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.